I'm going to illustrate credit default swaps with a fire insurance example, hypothetical one. I own a house and I buy fire insurance on it. The house burns down, I get a million dollars from my fire insurance policy. Now assume hypothetically 40 other people have made a side bet on whether my house will burn down. So there are 40 other policies set to pay a million dollars if it does. These policies, however, aren't purchased from insurance companies the way mine was, but rather take the form of credit default swaps. Let's call them house burndown swaps. These house burndown swaps are analogous to credit default swaps and thus bypass the capital reserve requirement and the insurable risk practice of regulated insurance companies. My house burns down. Forty other people line up to collect side bets of a million from the various party, parties selling the swaps. And remember, these people didn't have to have an insurable risk. I own the house. I care if it burns down. These people could be arsonists, for all we know. Let's say that only five sellers sold these swaps. So that would be eight million a seller. But they're highly leveraged. So they only have $200,000 of their own money in the entity that's selling these swaps. The rest is borrowed from banks. Thus, an everyday event like my house burning down, which in the real world will yield an, a $1 million payment from an insurance company well capitalized to pay it, has through side bets in swaps led to bank losses of $39 million. Now consider the infinite variations of this example to get some idea of the problem derivatives pose at the level of 55 trillion of them out there. In my example, an initial loss of 1 million has been magnified through undisclosed side bets to a $39 million problem for banks. And this is why we are having such a big impact on the banks. Originally, they weren't supposed to be lending to highly leveraged uh, speculative investors. They were supposed to be lending into the real economy. And they did do that ever since the Great Depression until the Glass-Steagall Act, which prevented this kind of lending, was repealed in 1999. You might say swaps are just like options, which have been uh, written and honored for years without any problems occurring. But options are clear through the Chicago Board of Options Exchange, which makes sure strict financial requirements are met by the people who are selling these options so that they will be honored when the time comes. Also, they flow through the Central Clearinghouse of the Chicago Board of Options Exchange on terms disclosed to the participant. And they're also, in general, not bought from entities having such fantastic leverage as hedge funds and investment banks selling CDSs took on. For all these reasons, that market is orderly. Lehman Brothers' failure and the subsequent reaction to it by the financial markets illustrate the dangers raised by credit default swaps traded in the trillions with no disclosure, no central clearinghouse, no central reporting, very high leverage, and no collateral required for the side bets. Remember, AIG, AAA rated, did not have to come up with any collateral. In the market, $400 billion worth of credit default swaps were sold on $150 billion of underlying Lehman debt. Now, you might argue that the people who held the bonds would, be, would have a justifiable reason to buy insurance in the form of credit default swaps. But what about the other $250 billion? Those were uh, typically bought by hedge funds, and they represented side bets on whether Lehman would fail. Now, remember, in 2004, the SEC eliminated the uptick rule, which said that in order to short a, a stock, the stock had to be moving up. You couldn't beat it up while it was down. They got rid of that rule. And that rule is especially important for financial institutions, which even ordinary banks are levered 10 to 1. So they depend on the confidence of the public. Getting rid of that rule enabled hedge funds to short Lehman into the ground. It's like allowing an arsonist to buy insurance on your house. He has no interest in whether it burns down or not. In fact, he wants to burn it down to collect. These hedge funds could, in effect, burn down Lehman and collect. They had no insurable risk, like I have when I insure my own house. OK. In addition, it's estimated that Lehman, in addition to having these bonds 
the subject of credit default swaps, issued $13 trillion worth of, of derivatives to other parties. So when it failed, it, it, it created a big problem in the world financial markets. The finance minister of France has characterized allowing Lehman to fail as a dramatic policy error. With its vast interconnecting financial relationships, Lehman's bankruptcy set off a meltdown of the world financial system, forcing North America, Britain, Europe, and parts of Asia to rescue their banks. Now the consequences are unfolding. They started to give warning back in 2005. In March of 2005, the subprime lenders index peaked. In July of 2005, the Dow Jones Home Builder Index peaked. And in August, the S&P Home Building Index peaked. In July of, uh, July of 06, the Florida condo market peaked. We know where that is right now. In November of 06, the Mortgage Derivative Lender Index peaked. The banking index topped in February, no, March of 07. The first two hedge funds of Bear Stearns collapsed in June of 07. There was a, a, a run on Countrywide Bank in July of 07. Northern Rock uh, Bank in England had a run in August of 07. The Fed created an auction facility to provide emergency funding for banks in November of 07. In, in December of 07, the U.S. banking reserves turned negative. In March of 08, consumer confidence falls to its lowest level in 15 years. And in July of 08, Freddie Mac collapses. This is a chart showing volume of stock sales of Freddie Mac and its stock price. In July of 07, you see the stock price plunging and volume increasing. The federal government had to put Fed, Freddie Mac, a mortgage insurance lender, into receivership. And we can see that the Fed is reacting over here. And this is before the September 29th stock market meltdown. Already, by, by, from July through September of 08, they had lent a quarter, a quarter of a trillion dollars to prevent banks from failing. This is a further consequence. On September 29th of 08, we experienced the largest point drop in history in the Dow, not the largest percentage, it's, but the largest point drop of 778 points. And this was the day that Congress failed to pass the bank rescue plan called Trouble Asset Reco Re Relief Plan. A further consequence unfolding from the financial meltdown caused by these derivatives is job losses. And we can see the last uh, two recessions are plotted here. The blue line shows the recession of 1990. What we have here is months from the peak of employment and job losses from that in, in the recession, a very, fairly mild recession. The red line represents the 2001 recession. The green line represents the present recession. And what we can see here is that job losses are heading straight down. We haven't even hit the point of inflection. So this is what's scaring our, our policymakers and the Fed. Here's a bank run on the left in 1933 in New York, and on the right, a bank run in 2008, Indy Mac, a big mortgage, uh, subprime mortgage lender. And I could point out here that uh, deficits, which we're racking up at very large rates, are, are dominated the spending part of those deficits dominated in recessions by job losses because the tax receipts plunge very fast when people lose their jobs. So we end up here with the final note. If derivative contracts are honored in the bailout of various failing financial institutions, the Lehman example shows that speculators will be handsomely rewarded for contributing to the fall of Lehman via their side bets and short selling. And they'll be handsomely rewarded with taxpayer money. So the question arises, how does subsidizing speculators with taxpayer money benefit the real economy? And I'll leave you with, those, with that question and wrap the presentation up here. Thank you very much.